Thank you, Ashini, ladies and gentlemen. We are really very honored that you could consider joining us today. I know it's a busy afternoon, and especially on the road, so thank you. There, are, there is one very important um, issue that we want to today share and celebrate. It is the fact that over many years, through the concept of CSR, I think many of us individually have done wonderful things. And I think most of our members uh, are, have witnessed to that fact. But today, it symbolizes the first time in Sri Lanka that we have a collaboration amongst several private sector entities with the national good in mind with CSR. Of course, you have a wonderfully positive outcome in mind. But together, we can do something much, much greater. Because as so many people say, and as the reality of climate change, of the issues that threaten us in relation to the environment, as they manifest themselves, we are living in an age, possibly the first generation, that faces the prospect of losing things in nature that many of us hold dear. And so that tends to sharpen the focus a little bit. And so I'm really thrilled that BSL, that Biodiversity Sri Lanka, can inaugurate this life project because it symbolizes a fundamental change in the private sector, acknowledging the fact that business is here to serve humanity through environment and through humanitarian aspects. It is a reality that has been upon us for many years. But through this project, we hope to demonstrate to others who are doing great things that together we can be stronger. And I want to add our particular appreciation for the Department of Forest for the State, our state partner, because Mr. Anura Satrosingha particularly has been a facilitator who has strengthened us. It is in Sri Lanka, there is a, uh, it is very fashionable to talk about PPPs, but in terms of their actual delivery, it needs strong goodwill and strength amongst the public and the private sector institutions. And so I think this is truly a partnership that I would like to express our appreciation, not only to the state sector, but to each of the individual private sector actors. Now, it might not seem to be a very large extent that we are working on at this point, the 10 hectares, but I believe its significance goes well beyond this 10 hectares, because in looking to repair the damage that has been done in this degraded land, for whatever reason, and in looking to restore it to a, 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 to, to a state of uh, equilibrium, natural equilibrium, we are establishing a benchmark not only to understand what potential there might be in the biodiversity credit accruals in order to be able to benefit not only the state sector but other actors in returning land to pristine states, but also we will be looking to acknowledge the fact that whatever action we take as plantations or whatever business we do, we do have an impact on nature and we do also benefit from nature. So I um, particularly in invited my colleagues to consider having this event here because at the front of this, uh, at the, near the entrance of this MJF Center West, you have our One Earth Arboretum. Now that arboretum is dedicated in particular to help each of us, the students, but also the business sector, everyone really, to understand that there is enormous value in ecosystem services. We take for granted so much that nature gives us. But when you really consider the air we breathe, the purity of the water, and when you understand for a few minutes to see what solutions there are to the threats that face us in the climate, in relation to climate, in relation to sustainability, you can truly see that with a little bit of effort amongst us by collaboration with the state sector, with academia, amongst private sector, 
we can do amazing things. We can deliver a Sri Lanka that is beautiful, that is sustainable to the next generation. I know that sounds like a very lofty objective, but every ambitious vision needs a first step. So today, we are really privileged that you have joined us in this celebration. And whilst thanking you for your time, I would like to invite the Conservator General, Mr. Anra Satru Singha, to share a few words. Anra, if you could. Thank you, Dilhan. I think uh, what I have to say has been already said by you. So this is something uh, which we really expect from the private sector. This is, uh, as uh, Harshini mentioned, this is really a new initiative and also a unique initiative for Sri, not only for the Sri Lanka, but for the forest department because uh, now the forest department right now, we have taken the target and, and the challenge to increase the forest cover in this country. So it's really a challenge because uh, what is really needed is the restoration, which we have never thought of like uh, ten, five, ten years before. Restoration is something really different from the reforestation or afforestation where we focus on single species and also the exotics uh, which produce a lot of timber or whatever the forest produce we uh, target. But when it comes to the restoration, it's really to uh, work with uh, native species in most of the cases, especially in uh, our, uh, to meet our objective, as well as to work with really uh, degraded areas where you need a lot of uh, technical inputs, uh, like uh, to maintain soil, uh, soil fertility as well as uh, the watering and various other sort of uh, environmental problems which are there. So, uh, so for this reason then we initiated from the government side, we initiated uh, this for the first time in 2015 and uh, we were able to uh, establish like uh, 7,500 hectares up to now. But uh, the, our experience is, it's not uh, really 100% successful because of the reasons I mentioned. Because uh, we started with our traditional uh, approaches uh, like uh, replanting and identify, replanting, reforestation type of activity. But then we found that it was not the correct path we have followed. There are a lot to do. And I mean, we are actually uh, learning by doing. So uh, now, uh, Together with that, even uh, this Biodiversity Sri Lanka as well as some other companies and also uh, one uh, NGO with the uh, UN Forest Service started uh, uh, some activities uh, in selected areas. Now, uh, uh, so with that, I think uh, especially mentioned to this biodiversity approach, which was really, I mean, they had a uh, number of discussions with the forest department and they came and presented their results and all these things. So I think it was really a sort of a systematic approach to uh, develop and enhance the forest in our country. So uh, even as of today, I think uh, they are achieving very good uh, successful results, which is going to be a very good example, not only a technically uh, sound example, but also the PPP uh, type of uh, relationships, which are really new to the government, as, as especially for the forest department, which is really a new chapter. So I really uh, thank uh, the Biodiversity Sri Lanka, as well as uh, the Dilma Conservation for initiating this. And thank you very much. I wish you all the success. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is um, an honor to see you all here. Uh, it's great to see this gathering, not only the private sector whom we represent, but the students whom we are working. The next generation is more important uh, for us to actually pass the message on. Now, our role here 
how she needs their workers and mine, uh, is to try and tell you a little bit about, uh, very quickly, uh, the project and what we're trying to do because uh, I think some of you may be well aware of it, but there are others who perhaps would like to learn a little bit more. Uh, so to kick off, I'd ask Hashini to quickly tell you a little bit about Biodiversity Sri Lanka. So Biodiversity Sri Lanka, as um, some of you might know, uh, started off, was established in August 2012. That's our tagline, making the environment everyone's business. So basically we work with the private sector in collaborative uh, projects and this is one of our ma uh, biggest projects that we are trying to launch today. Just to tell you a little bit about members, we are totally member driven and all our members represent the private sector. We have four categories of members and our, our patron members are listed here. We have 32 of them up to date. And as you can see, they represent, I mean, even patron members and uh, other members represent uh, a wide array of industry sectors, around six to seven, including banking, uh, manufacturing, uh, plantations, so on and so forth. And these are, uh, are our 33 general members who are on board up to date. And I would like to say that we have more members uh, considering coming on board uh, with us. Then we have one associate member. Uh, this is a non-fee living uh, membership category where uh, the UNDP has come on board to help us mainly on technical uh, aspects. And uh, they are currently our only associate member. And we have just launched the SME membership uh, at our last uh, AGM. And Glide Private Limited has come on board as our first SME member. And I'm glad to say that there are more considering uh, considering that the, the SME sector's impact on biodiversity is much higher in collect collect collectivity uh, rather than the bigger companies. In terms of member gains, this is what Biodiversity Sri Lanka provides to all our members. Uh, some of the benefits, so showcasing best practices which are already available within, uh, within our members and outside, internationally and locally. Uh, Roundtable discussions and workshops and training programs, uh, virtual and actual forums to discuss, uh, have dialogue and talk about, discuss debate uh, and talk about uh, what is happening in the biodiversity conservation arena in terms of private sector's contribution. And we also provide access to the national and international conservation priorities by means of uh, connecting them to international and national organizations which are working on these things, the government agencies which are uh, responsible for certain areas in our country and also access to technical experts. So we have a technical resource bank, including people like Professor Devaka, Professor uh, Dr. Nirmali Pallavata, who um, help us uh, in all our work, uh, in providing their technical expertise. Then we also have provide access to a project bank, online and also offline, uh, if any of the private sector companies would like to uh, talk about their uh, intentions in terms of implementing projects in Sri Lanka. We help them identify what topics that they should be focusing on and which areas, localities that they should be working in so that they make the most benefit out of their investments. Also, in terms of benchmarking, certification and award schemes, you can read lo a lot more about it on our website, www.biodiversitysrilanka.org, where we have launched our own biodiversity project ranking scheme and there are so many other plans also on the way uh, to make sure that certification and award schemes are a part of uh, our member recognition. Green image building and overall value addition are some, as I said, these are all, these are some of the benefits that our private sector members uh, receive by becoming members. And I will uh, leave it to Mrs. Yasaratna to talk about the rest uh, in terms of introducing the project to you today. Sorry, I missed one slide. So uh, I'd also like to say that Biodiversity Sri Lanka was the first national platform from South Asia to gain membership of the Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity, uh, the Secretariat of which was, uh, is, is a part of the Convention on Biological Diversity located in Montreal. And um, it was the first national platform from South Asia and the second in the whole of Asia, really. And uh, we constantly participate in their discussions at the global level to bring uh, that, that information that we receive there to localize and implement and uh, kind of share it with our members. Yes, Mrs. Yasaratna will take over. Okay, so here's the project and there's no better person 
uh, to speak about it than our own Professor Devaka Virakon, uh, who from day one has stood by us. It was a wild dream at the beginning, uh, but always we had Devaka standing behind us, helping us to design this project. So it's over to you, Devaka. Thank you, Shirani. Um, I think this project and uh, many ways today's event signifies a major paradigm shift in the business world from P to 3Ps to 3Ps plus R. Because first of all, they were thinking only of profit, but now uh, after that, when they realize that profit alone is not sufficient, if it is made at the expense of the society and the environment, uh, it became the realization of the triple bottom line uh, approach, uh, people, profit, and planet. And that is what led to all these CSR initiatives and things of that nature, where the companies are putting back some of their profits into the society and the environment. But what we see is that itself is not sufficient because the world is exceeding its limits in number of areas, especially when it comes to climate and also biodiversity. So just three P's alone is not enough. We have to go to the next level, which is three P's plus R, where R stands for restoration. So what we see is we are losing a lot of forest across the world. Also in Sri Lanka, we are losing forest at a fairly alarming rate. And this is leading to loss of species and also loss of habitat, loss of fragment, uh, fragmentation of habitat and so on. So ecological restoration is a process that we have to bring in to assist the recovery of ecosystems that are either damaged, destroyed or degraded and thereby try to increase the carrying capacity and give nature an opportunity to survive. So this project is basically one such project that we are trying to restore a completely degraded habitat which I will show in a moment. So this, I think, a lot of people, when it comes to reforestation project, they think just going and planting a bunch of trees. No, I think we would like to bring a little more science into this. What we would like to uh, establish is a complex forest like this, uh, taking into consideration the actual plant species uh, that are there in that uh, system. So when we uh, start working on uh, restoration, there are various levels of restoration. If you take a degraded piece of land, as you can see in this picture, given time, it will reach a climax for us. But our problem today is we are out of time. So we have to facilitate this process, and that is where restoration comes in to speed up the natural ecological succession to reach the end point much quicker than naturally it would take place. So this is why we have started thinking of this uh, restoration project. A little bit about the project background. Uh, we came up with the project concept a couple of years ago. Then we went into the site and we did all the basic work. We have established a baseline. So so we know what is there in the site and we have also uh, recorded what is in the adjacent forest. So now we know what is the benchmark we want to achieve and what we have. So we sort of have a picture where we are heading. So basically phase one was uh, the development of the restoration plan. So these are the partners, the forest department, Bandar City Secretariat and IUCN and I had the a good fortune of heading that team from IUCN to do the baseline work. So the uh, work was funded by these partners and uh, this is the site you see here. This is the Kandalia Forest Reserve. You can see it's a very small area in the periphery of the forest reserve and this is an enlarged version of that. The entire area is covered by Kakila Fernland. What has happened is this area has been subjected to cultivation and abandoned. Now the land is taken over by uh, ferns and the land will not proceed into the next stage because the ferns have a, a habit of catching fire. So it is getting stuck in that point. You can see here, if you look at this side, this brown indicates this here is burnt fern. And so this is going through a cycle of burning and again ferns growing, burning and so on, so it doesn't proceed in the uh, ecological succession. So once again you can see what the site looks like, a lot of fern and with few little forest patches. So basically uh, what we would like to do is try and achieve something like this. So when we went to this site we had two options. 
either go for the tree planting like that or try and achieve this. That would have been much easier to go with a monoculture and just come up with a, a woodlot. But a forest is not a woodlot, it's a much more complicated structure and this is what we have decided to pursue in this restoration project. To just to give you some idea about uh, what is there, uh, what you can see here is uh, the, what is in the project site, uh, the number of uh, plants that were recorded, and you can see this is the, uh, the, the diversity. Uh, you have two columns. The dark column indicates what's in the adjacent forest, and the light column indicates what's in the site itself. And when you compare the numbers, you can see if you look at the diversity, uh, in the forest, it's much higher, 154, compared to 34 in the site. If you look at the number of endemics, 81 in the forest, only 3 in this degraded site. So I don't think I have to tire you with all these numbers, but I think the point is very clear. The forest supports high diversity, high endemics, high number of threatened species, and our site at the moment is supporting very little diversity. So uh, when it comes to fauna, the situation is the same. The forest is much richer in terms of species, endemic and threatened species. So this also tells us what is the challenge ahead of us. What we try to do is take this patch, take it from light green to dark green over a period of 20 or 30 years. That is where we are trying to head. So uh, that gives us the benchmark we are seeking. The challenges we face is one is fire. We'll have to somehow uh, come up with a way to uh, stop fire in this site because the fire will prevent us from proceeding with the planting program. The second issue is we have a lot of large herbivores, there are sambas visiting the site. They will browse on the plant, so we'll have to cordon off our site at first to keep these big herbivores away from the site until the plants grow up to a certain size, uh, which again is going to be a costly process because you'll have to cordon off a 10 hectare plot. And so we already have now identified what plants that should go in because we know the, the list of plants that are in the forest. We know at what level you have to go in and uh, because some plants are pioneers, some will come later. So we have already identified and, uh, the types of things that we have to go. And uh, I think one of the biggest challenges we will have is site preparation because right now it's a degraded soil so we'll have to deal with that to get rid of the fern and we'll have to prepare it to receive the forest trees. So we are thinking of a, a two-tiered plan, two years for site preparation, setting up planting material, etc. And then the next three years, a continuous planting program to plant the, the identified trees in the site and gap filling. So basically, what we try to do is convert this degraded forest into the, the typical forest type that is there. Uh, but what we have to bear in mind is growing, destroying forest is easy. You don't take a long time to destroy a piece of forest. But growing one is not an easy task. It will take maybe 20 years for us to see some solid results. But I think within a few years, we will know whether we are heading in the right direction or not. But in order to really prove whether this is going to work, it will take some time. So I think those of who are going to uh, invest on it will have to have a little patience, bear with us uh, in the long run. And one of the most important thing is this monitoring, because we'll have to monitor this process, document everything, because at the end we'll have to tell the story. What did we do right? Where did we go wrong? What are the things that we have learned from this project? And are we really reaching the benchmark we have set for? So uh, we are thinking of a very rigorous monitoring program, a pre-project baseline which has already been established, and during implementation and during uh, at the initial part and also in the mid part, and the end we will have a continuous monitoring uh, program. Uh, so we are going to look at number of aspects because we're not only going to look at the change in species, but we'll also try and focus on some of the ecosystem services, the physical and chemical changes, the water quality, the water yield, and things of that nature during this monitoring program. So I think I'll turn it back to Shirani. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Devaka. Uh, I think uh, that was all about the project and as the next five years you will be actively involved uh, in helping us to restore this site. Uh, we expect the companies who are partners and others to join with us, you know, in going over there and working with us uh, in uh, trying to do what Devaka explained. Now, at the same time, whilst we are doing the restoration, some of us will also start working on looking at uh, uh, how the site is enhancing ecosystems and biodiversity. So um, we think that there are two types of credits uh, which can be recognized in a site like this. There can be ecosystem credits and of course the species credits that will come as the uh, diversity increases, uh, you know, the enhancing of uh, the ecosystem will produce uh, a better uh, setting uh, for us to start looking at whether actually this is happening. Our referral site is right next door, it's a Carnelia rainforest uh, and uh, we are aspiring uh, to try uh, to uh, make our site somewhat uh, close to the site that we are using as our referral site. Uh, so basically we will try to uh, figure out uh, the calculation of credits. Uh, this has not been done in Sri Lanka before. Uh, we are linking up with international organizations uh, headed by IUCN uh, and also we have forged links with the University of Colombo School of Computing uh, because there will be uh, some kind of computer modeling simulation uh, also uh, to be done as a part of this calculation. So the team, IUCN team, uh, together with all of you, uh, will be generating the monitoring data for us. Uh, we'll be uh, carefully looking, uh, we have the baseline already set up and we'll be carefully looking at how uh, the whole ecosystem is changing over time uh, and hopefully we'll be able to work out a scheme uh, which, uh, which we possibly can uh, then say that uh, the, the biodiversity or the ecosystem has enhanced by this amount of units. So this is new, uh, this is something that we will be working on. Uh, we are not sure whether it's going to be a complete success, uh, but I'm sure with the support that we have uh, from our international bodies like UNDP and also IUCN, uh, we will be able to uh, work this out. So you will be a pioneer uh, in this effort and uh, we are uh, just adding that this will be a second part of our program. Now, the people who had faith in us and backed us up are here. And um, today we are going to start this project. And we'd like to acknowledge from Biodiversity Sri Lanka our patron members who are listed here, who are today going to become an active part of our project. So thank you very much for listening to our incessant nonsensical talk for the last one year. Perhaps you thought it was mind-boggling at the time, but then you managed to convince your boards, which is not easy, and you know, you are our representatives, and today we are proud that you are here and you are going to help us to do this project. So thank you, these agencies, and, and also I just like to acknowledge that both Commercial Bank and Sampath Bank are considering uh, joining us in this effort. So thank you also to those two banks uh, to uh, be with us today. Um, so let's join hands in making a change for the better. And we have a saying here, the last word in ignorance is the person who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? So thank you very much, and it's so over to Dilhan. Thank you, Shivani. Thank you. And thank you, Devaka, for the intro and Harshini. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1947, the University of Chicago <coughs> launched a project called the Manhattan Project. Amongst its outcomes was the Doomsday Clock. I don't know if you have heard of it, but the Doomsday Clock was uh, intended to symbolize how close we are to apocalypse to the end of the world. Um, a few, well, last month, the doomsday clock read two minutes to midnight. Not, not since the height of the Cold War has the doomsday clock, that is since 1953, has the doomsday clock been so close to midnight. And amongst the two reasons, of course, there is uh, uh, the political antics of various uh, players around the world and uh, playing with their nuclear buttons, but there is also unchecked 
climatic dangers, which is significant in the reason for the doomsday clock being moved to two minutes to midnight, closer to midnight than it has ever been. And so I therefore underline what Devaka shared with you a moment ago. The time for CSR and focus on process, showing pictures of nice plants, showing pictures of trees, um, doing things for the sake of doing them and for the sake of keeping shareholders happy is over. We are two minutes to midnight, literally. And as we heard already, uh, there is no alternative because we are all on one ship. The solutions are clear and they have been since 2005, more or less, since the uh, British government report came out, which talked of the solution to climate change, to all these threats that face us today, being much less costly than uh, dealing with the outcomes. Biodiversity is at the heart of all of those um, potential threats, and it is at the heart of what the corporates, what each of us can do. And I speak as Biodiversity Sri Lanka, but also as Dilma Ceylon Tea Company, one amongst uh, many uh, private sector actors here. And I hope and pray that this will be a template for the future. It's about collaboration, because we need to deliver national outcomes. We, of course, do need to do things that also serve certain uh, ends, with it, whether it is uh, in relation to our staff or in relation to specific projects. But whatever we do, we need to frame it in the national interest and deliver national outcomes because the time is now. So, ladies and gentlemen, with that uh, intention, I wrote to uh, a formidable lady in conservation, Aban Kabraji, and made a request from her as IUCN is a very fundamental validating scientific partner in this whole process, uh, if she might send us someone who would uh, be able to talk to us on the importance of this project, someone uh, who would have the right scientific knowledge and expertise. And fortunately, she responded positively, and I'm very honored today to welcome Christopher Howe. Christopher is uh, a citizen of one of my favorite countries in the world, New Zealand. He comes from a WWF background. <coughs> he has been a executive director of WWF New Zealand, conservation director. He has been head of Future Landscapes in the UK, also with WWF, before with the Hereford Wild Wildlife Trust, Cornwall Wild Wildlife Trust, and now IUCN Asia Projects Director in the Asian region. So I'm very grateful to IUCN for being a part of this project, for being also an initiating partner in the uh, Biodiversity Sri Lanka, and I would like to invite with great appreciation Chris to come up and share some thoughts with us. Thank you. Welcome, Chris. Right. Uh, thank, thank you for that very warm welcome, Dilhan, and um, thank you, everybody, for uh, welcoming me here today um, for this um, very exciting event. I'll just, um, I'll just get my PowerPoint ready. No, uh, it's a PowerPoint free zone. It's my presentation right here. So um, I want to acknowledge um, my director, Aban Marka Kabraji, for, um, for uh, offering me this opportunity. And she sends her, her apologies that she can't be here herself. Uh, and on behalf of Aban, I want to send you all her very best wishes for the project. She's got a very close interest in it. And uh, I'm sure we'll be following progress uh, as, we, as we proceed over the next few years. Um, it's a great opportunity for me. And thank you for, for allowing me to, to share some of my, my thoughts with you this afternoon. Um, I, I'd like to start by asking just uh, a couple of what, what might seem like obvious questions. And why are we all here today backing this project? Uh, launching this project, and, and why are projects like this so important? And I think, and I hope that everyone in the audience will today will probably already know the answer to that, and that's because global challenges 
need a global response. And a global response is made up of many actions, large and small, national, regional, local, by many players. And as we've already heard today, we should not be in any doubt that, um, that we, and by we I mean humanity as a whole, population of the planet as a whole, are currently facing some of the most significant challenges that, that we ever have. And we've seen a couple of uh, examples mentioned and indeed put up on the, on the PowerPoint just now to show exactly the kind of stress that, 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 the, planet is, uh, that the planet is facing. Uh, climate change, food and water security issues arising from the impacts of climate change, decline in biodiversity. And in 2018, it's more important than ever that we work together to tackle those images, uh, those, those issues. It's been mentioned already uh, by, by Dilhan that uh, actually, uh, if we all do our own thing, if we do things for the sake of our image or our brand, it's probably not going to be enough. Uh, the scale and the urgency of the issues demand something else. And I'd like to illustrate that by just taking us to some other places just for a moment. Uh, one of those places is uh, about 11,500 kilometers due south of where we're sitting today. Um, so in early 2017, out of a colony of about 40,000 Adelie penguins on Petrels Island in Antarctica, 38,998 died of starvation. So all but two died of starvation. Petrels Island happens to be pretty much the closest part of Antarctica to where we're sitting today. And at the other end of the planet, in the Arctic, scientists reported in late 2017 that of the cohort of polar bears that they were studying, more than half couldn't find enough to eat. And they were losing two kilograms in body weight every day. So their conclusion was that polar bears could go extinct within a few decades, if not sooner. Uh, it, that is, if they have anywhere to live, given that their habitat is reducing by no less than 13% a year. These are huge changes in the planet around us. If we look southwest, that way, uh, to South Africa, in just, in just a few days' time, uh, I think beginning of April, fresh water will run out in Cape Town. Uh, there's a trend of reducing rainfall coupled with a drought, um, almost certainly to do to, with climate change, uh, and people will not have any water coming out of their taps. Um, and close to home, the, um, the purple-faced langur here in Sri Lanka, one of the most critically endangered species of primate in the world, uh, roughly the same number as Hector's dolphin in New Zealand, where I spent the last 15 years, or the vaquita dolphin in Mexico, um, all down to just a few tens or dozens of individuals or pairs, all suffering from human uh, wildlife interactions, from climate change, lack of food, lack of habitat. So across the board, what we see uh, are the issues that are global coming really close to home, somewhere. Everyone here has a very direct connection to, to the global issues that are, that are threading our planet and our way of life. I mean, we already know in Sri Lanka, for example, um, thanks to the vulnerability studies, that temperatures will go up affecting crops. Some areas will get more rain. Some areas will get less rain. Coastal areas will need to be resilient to storm surges and sea level rise. These things are with us right now here today. So I make those points, and they sound like they sound quite dramatic and they sound somewhat difficult, but I make them to, to illustrate that, that these challenges, although they're global, the action to do something about them starts with individual actions, no matter how small. Um, those uh, examples are just the tip of the iceberg, because while our population keeps climbing and becomes more resource hungry per capita, uh, then, then if we don't do something urgently, uh, things will get much worse. For example, I mean, we already need one and a half planets to sustain our lifestyle, but unfortunately we only have one planet. So if we keep growing our population and growing our resource demands, um, we will need to do things quite differently. Um, the evidence is right there. WWF and ZSLs, Living Planet Report, 
global, global ecosystem assessments, the IUCN red list of endangered species, all the indicators are heading the wrong way. So we're all part of the problem, therefore there's only one option, we must all be part of the solution. And that's why we're here today, to see firsthand how our actions and commitments can create a better future for the planet. Um, and I want to draw a very direct and very tangible link between the project we're talking about and these global problems. And I'll just go a bit further on that uh, in the next part of the talk. Um, because there is a bit of history here about this movement that has led to the place where we are today launching this project. Um, the Stockholm Environment Conference, 1972, Nairobi, 1982, the famous Brundtland Report, Our Common Future, 1987, but perhaps the most significant one, the Rio Earth Summit in 92, the one that led to the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Desertification uh, um, Convention, and so on and so on. Um, because what those conferences did, and, and what's become even more apparent in this connected age, is that our individual actions and our individual projects, you know, I mean large, small projects, local, national, regional, delivered by communities or companies or governments or partnerships, they actually have to add up to something. Um, they need to be tied together. They need to be aligned. They actually all need to be doing the right thing, pulling in the same direction. They must actually add up to more than the sum of their parts. And that's why the Sustainable Development Goals, we already heard them mentioned today, uh, they were agreed in December 2014. Um, that's why they're so important, because they pull together, am I standing too close or too far away? Uh, they pull together the collective action that we need to see a better planet for ourselves and for our children and our grandchildren, as well as the plants and animals that we share, share the earth with. Now, it's also, and this is quite an important point that we'll come back to at the end, it's also why monitoring and reporting, boring as that might, may sound, I mean, no one can often gets excited about monitoring and reporting. It's usually the thing you have to do in order to do your project, but it's actually really, really important to be able to demonstrate what you've done transparently is absolutely vital. And that's particularly important for this project and this concept of biodiversity credits that we just heard about and which we'll come back to a little bit later. So there are 17 sustainable development goals with a somewhat daunting um, 169 targets. So no one can remember all of them. You have to refer to them on a piece of paper. Uh, but they're all interlinked and interdependent and Really, crucially, they require governments, businesses, and civil society to work together. And in fact, the 17th goal, the last one, is actually about partnership. So it requires society, business, and governments to work together to achieve these 17 goals. And, and they actually provide a, a, a pretty important roadmap for everyone on, uh, and the environment on which we depend. So you'll already have um, worked out that, of course, this project is a prime example of SDG 17 because it involves civil society and business and government and non-government organizations and all kinds of partners. And so with, uh, um, with that approach, it demonstrates perfectly what's set out in SDG 17. So when I was trying to find some other examples um, in preparation for this speech, it's actually quite difficult, if not impossible, to find a coalition that resembled this coalition. Uh, and so in that way, as we've already heard, you really are breaking new ground and setting a fantastic example about how to go about this kind of restoration, this kind of putting right the ecosystems and environment that, that we depend on. So I've, I've been with, with uh, IUCN for just over a year after leaving WWF, um, although I've been a, an IUCN Commission member for, for much longer, for about 20 years. And I'll just digress just for a moment because 
Um, for those of you who don't know IUCN very well, International Union for Conservation of Nature, we're a union of members, and members can be member states, government entities, non-government organizations, indigenous people's organizations, uh, and the members are IUCN. We also have six expert commissions with thousands and thousands of volunteers who, uh, who are experts in their field. They might be working for universities or governments or other organizations. They volunteer their expertise to make up our six expert commissions. And then we have about a thousand staff. And so we'll come back to this later, and I promise there won't be a test at the end, but IUCN is made up of these three pillars, our members, our commissions, and our staff. And that's what gives IUCN this, this incredible diverse strength uh, and our ability to work across multiple platforms in multiple kinds of projects for the benefit of the future of our planet. Um, but what I want to do, just return to my point, was when I started with IUCN a year ago, one thing that really impressed me was the commitment and alignment of our conservation work to the Sustainable Development Goals. So, um, in fact, IUCN's conservation program is 100% aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals. And so I just wanted to re-emphasize that um, with your project being such a, a, a dynamic and good example of meeting SDG 17, uh, and IUCN being fully aligned with the SDGs. In fact, even though the SDGs sound like some kind of global, maybe, you know, slightly bureaucratic way of saying what our future might be, they are actually incredibly important, and, um, and this project is, is, is an important part of that. Um, so I'm just going to turn now to two areas of work, of IUCN's work, that, that are directly relevant to the project, to the life project that we're here today to launch. And um, obviously I can only touch on some of the, the experience of IUCN, uh, that IUCN's gained over the, the, the decades since we were established in 1948. But, um, but of course, you have perfect uh, and easy access to our IUCN team here. Um, and, uh, and obviously our website, you can always find out more there. But I want to talk briefly just about um, the whole principle of partnership with business. So now businesses have been getting involved in, in the environment and conservation for, for some decades. Um, Unilever, for example, is a really good, exa a really good example of, of thinking in the long term about supply of raw materials. Marks and Spencer, they've got a plan, they call it Plan A because there's no Plan B because there's no Planet B. Um, so we've only got one planet, back to that one planet living concept. And of course Dilma um, here who've been, if you like, leading the way in, in this kind of work here in Sri Lanka. But it was the Rio Plus 20 conference, 2012, where business and environment sustainability really took off. I mean, in my opinion, it really took off in a way that it hadn't before. And that's partly because uh, governments at the Rio Plus 20 conference weren't able to do as much as they had done 20 years before. It was much harder. So business took over. And uh, things like the UN Global Compact, um, these declarations, these communiques from business really came out of the 2012 conference. And the UN Global Compact now provides this, uh, these global leading principles for business engagement. Human rights, labor, environment, anti-corruptions, and meeting society's needs. And so corporate social responsibility that Dilhan was talking about, driven by those five principles, is now is taking off in a way that we didn't see before 2012. Uh, it's flowing through as we speak. I mean, just last week, Coca-Cola announced a new sustainability strategy. They said they'll replenish 100% of the water they use when they're working in water stress locations. The water stress location is a place where there's not enough water. They will put 100% of the water they use back. And now that's quite a big commitment. Um, and that's just last week. So for IUCN and IUCN's Business and Biodiversity Program, which actually saw its genesis here with IUCN Sri Lanka, engage with hundreds of businesses, large and small. And we focus now on these three key areas of work to drive those changes valuing biodiversity, promoting biodiversity net gain, 
and investing in nature. So these are, they're general, they're broad, but they're tangible, practical components of business sustainability. Uh, and so our, our network, our three pillars, our staff, our commissions, our members, mean that we can engage with business on those three areas across the world um, in all kinds of ways. For example, um, the business for the, the uh, Leaders for Nature program, IUC in India, uh, working with a global drinks company to reduce discharge of plastics in the Mekong Basin, have a habitat scale restoration in China and Myanmar. So I think the, the, the way that those three show up in our work is particularly relevant to this project, um, particularly this development of the biodiversity credit accrual system. What is that if it's, if it's not valuing nature? We are in some way trying to say, how much is this restoration? What does it represent? What does it represent to the investors uh, once it's restored? And the habitat restoration component that will lead us there, that's directly investing in nature. So the project is strongly aligned in two of the three areas uh, that, that IUCN works in its business and, bi uh, and biodiversity program. And the end result, of course, is that making sure for IUCN, helping, supporting and encouraging business to play its role in a sustainable future for the planet. And um, I, for quite a while, uh, I did wonder about the business and biodiversity link. And then one day I was talking to, uh, as it happens, a union representative, like a labor union. And I said, she, she said, oh, we're really, we're really keen on this. You know, we're absolutely committed to this business engagement. I was like, unions, well, why, why, why would you be so interested? She said, easy, no planner, no jobs. Um, and for business leaders, no planner, no markets. So there's actually more to it. Uh, there's more to it. Uh, there's a commercial driver to this. Apart from the moral, ethical and altruistic motives, there's a commercial driver. Um, and I think if you look at some economies now, those that have headed towards austerity, for example, the austerity measures, you can actually see uh, that if everything's in decline and the economy's in decline, and then everyone suffers. So better to have a thriving environment full of natural resources, providing raw materials and well-being, and a thriving uh, jobs and society. So it all makes sense. So the other part that I just wanted to mention, what about the forest restoration itself? Well, once again, IUCN works at all levels, from the global to the local. And at a global scale, uh, perhaps the thing I wanted to mention most of all was the bond challenge. And the bond challenge is this uh, outrageously ambitious uh, commitment to, to try and get, no, no, these are real numbers, 350 million hectares of deforested and degraded land into restoration initiatives by 2030. So I reckon that's about 12 years away. Um, 350 million hectares is a lot. Um, and, and for IUCN, we promote this idea of forest landscape restoration and restoration opportunities to try and look at landscapes on a big scale, bring together agriculture and forestry and other land uses within a forest ma matrix so that you've effectively got a living landscape. And um, I thank Dilhan for mentioning my distant past as a head of the future landscapes team at WWF because actually that's exactly what forest landscape restoration is. It's thinking about what the future landscape could look like and, uh, and a future landscape full of people and wildlife and habitat thriving in good condition. These are the kinds of things that we aspire to. Um, now, it's not just about that kind of uh, view of, 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 uh, of the future. Actually, the bond challenge, if it's achieved, when it's achieved, it will generate about $170 billion a year, US dollars, from net benefits from watershed protection, crop yields, forest products. It could sequester 1.7 gigatons of carbon. Um, and already 160 million hectares have been pledged through 47 commitments. Now, 160 million hectares also sounds like a lot. Um, but every single hectare counts, and you know what I'm going to say next. 
Um, so we're talking about 10 hectares today. Okay, so 10 hectares doesn't sound a lot when you put it up against 160 million, but every single hectare counts. Every single hectare is as valuable as any other single hectare. And even more importantly, not only does every single hectare count, but every single hectare can be counted. And I'll go back to my earlier point that um, whether it's through the bond challenge barometer, whether it's through, again, the monitoring systems that are going to be in place for this project, the credits, the biodiversity credits that you will establish to show that this habitat has been restored, those are transparent, communicable evidence that those hectares of forest have been restored. If you don't monitor, if you don't register, if you don't value and report transparently, then, well, I won't say it's not like it, it might as well have not happened, but if no one knows about it, if there's no evidence, it's off the radar, and it, it, it doesn't feature in the global picture. This project has everything. It has the monitoring scheme already up and running. Uh, it has the biodiversity credit system uh, scheduled in for design. So um, it's, it's really a model uh, example of that, that project that you're promoting here. Um, so of course we do work at that global level. We also work at the local level. And um, whether it's uh, for direct species conservation, like for example, we've re reforested and restored areas between in India and Nepal for joining up parts of tiger habitat. Uh, in Bihar and India, we're working with landscapes to get that food-based land use interwoven into the surrounding ecosystems, which is called agriscapes. Um, and here in Sri Lanka, uh, Ministry of Environment, University of Columbia and IUCN for the, the little tropical fish, the Bandula barb, work together, 50 pairs, 2009 roughly, maybe over, over 1,400 pairs today, um, by looking at the surrounding land use, the pollution, the collection of those fish, and bringing in the communities that lived around that area to help with the solution. Um, so we work all this 350 million global pledge all the way down to a few hectares in the field and everything in between. Um, by doing that, we're back to the three pillars, members, commissions, staff. It's what makes IUCN a, 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 a unique organization and, a, and an interesting organization, both to work for and to get involved with partners like this project today. Biodiversity credits. Well, IUCN can count amongst its members some of the pioneers in valuing nature through measurable units. New South Wales Department of Environment and Heritage, for example, Wildlife Trust in the UK and others. Now, many of those credit-based systems are, 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 have been built around offsetting development and trading, and that's not what you're trying to do here. Um, but they are about assigning some validation, some robust validation that says, yes, this hectare of forest has been restore, restored to a standard. We can verify and validate that. And um, to do that, and you probably guess what I'm going to say again, back to the old monitoring and evaluation. Starting with the baselines, monitoring all the way through, using robust science uh, in this living laboratory that you're about to create to be sure that what you've done has actually restored the forest. You can demonstrate it, you can prove it, and you can um, uh, make it transparent for everyone to see. Um, so for us, as part of this project, bringing in our regional global net networks to make sure those units are as credible as they can be is, is an important role that we'll play. And it's not a huge stretch of the imagination to think that um, in a few years' time, you could present dashboards at your board meetings and your partnership meetings uh, that show biodiversity credits on your balance sheet. So you've got your, your normal, your profit and loss, your assets and your liabilities, and sitting alongside it, you say, well, actually, our company is responsible for 100 or 200 or 1,000 or 2,000 biodiversity credits in Sri Lanka. That's one of the things that, that is part of our value as a company. A um, few, few observations before I finish, because um, I usually time my speeches, and if they're 18 minutes, I know they're going to be 25, so I apologize for that. Um, but a few personal observations. So when I was invited to give this address, I don't think anybody involved in that 
knew that I used to work in Cornwall in the UK where we actually restored uh, sites back to forest. Sites that were more or less the same size as the site you're about to restore and sites that not only more or less the same size also covered in ferns. So when I saw the photographs of, of your site it did you know, strike a chord with me from a quarter of a century ago um, as Cornwall is one of the least forested uh, counties in the UK. All the trees were cut down to fuel the pumps that pump the mines clear of water because it's a big mining county um, and if not that to hold up the tunnels of the mines under the ground so it's I think the second least or first least forested county in the whole of the UK so there's plenty of land that needs restoring to forest and um, so we have plenty of priority sites for restoration. I was also involved more recently in New Zealand in the country's first large landscape restoration so this is a uh, hundreds of square kilometers of, of land. It also had a valuing nature component just like yours. Uh, so we could say we were trying to work out ways of saying if we do this, what can we use to say what the overall improvement, the value of the overall improvement is. So I'm, I'm really I have a very personal connection and interest in what you're doing today. Very excited to see what's going on. would love to go and see the site uh, and, I, and I hope to come back and, and do that. But uh, and, and you knew there was a but coming there. Um, the project in New Zealand is about seven years old. Uh, its first phase is 10 years. The second phase is 40 years. So we'll measure our success in the New Zealand project by what the landscape looks like in 50 years time. So none of the people involved in the project today will be around to see that. So there's an intergenerational and long-term vision that needs to be in place before you even start otherwise it will come to nothing. And in Cornwall, where trees grow a bit more slowly than they do here, it will still be another 80 years before those sites are mature. Um, and even then, they won't have the full complement of species that they ought to have in the ancient woodlands that still remain in pockets in, in Cornwall. Um, so my message is that ambitious projects, especially ecological projects, even in the tropics where things grow fast, um, success doesn't happen overnight. That full species complement won't come back in five years or ten years. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that was said earlier as well, patience and staying the course is critical for the success here. So um, it just remains for me to, to commend you for your commitment and imagination and courage and, and wish you the very best and to thank uh, Dilma uh, for, for hosting and leadership and Biodiversity Sri Lanka, Change of Commerce, uh, the, the Department of Forests, the CEOs and representatives of partners, um, the students especially because intergenerationally, which is the only way that conservation can happen, actually we, you're the most important people in the room, we're depending on you. Um, and, and finally a special thanks to Dilhan for your, for your personal leadership and commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. <clears throat> so there is good news as well as bad news. So <clears throat> it's, uh, we'll take this as a challenge to the private sector in Sri Lanka to build corporations that will uh, turn the bad news into good news and hopefully turn the doomsday clock back to three minutes and, well, maybe more before midnight. So ladies and gentlemen, now we have uh, uh, the felicitation of the partners which will happen down in the butterfly garden. So I want to just uh, remind us ourselves who they, they are, Diesel and Motor Engineering, which is represented by Mr. Suresh Kunratna. Uh, Suresh will join us downstairs. Uh, Hatton National Bank, represented by Mr. Hemanta Seniviratna. <coughs> uh, Jetwing Hotels, we are waiting on uh, Hiran Kure. I think uh, Hiran should be here shortly. Nations Trust Bank by Mr. Teja Silva. People's Leasing and Finance PLC by Mr. Lionel Fernando. <coughs> Sam City Cement by Ms. Fazana Khan. <coughs> Virtusa by Denver De Silva and Dilma Silonti Company uh, by my colleague Asanka. Um, so we will sign shortly. And I want to also announce that we have a very beautiful painting, an original done specially for the occasion by uh, the famous architect and artist Tilak Samarikrama. Now this will be given in signed original to each of the, um, sorry, original signed copy 
uh, uh, to each of the uh, participants. Um, and we have a surprise, and I would like to invite our surprise to come along. Peter, please uh, join us and say a few things about what we are going to try after we return. Good. He's a bit taller than me. Good afternoon. Um, I'll tell you about what, what you're eating, but I think Christopher mentioned something about forests that hit my... Um, I mean, I'm chef. I, want, I like food. And food needs animals. It needs trees. It needs forests. It's called permaculture. And where I live in Noosa, we have lots of people that practice permaculture. And basically, you are putting everything back into the soil. And one of the most vital elements of permaculture is at the back of your farm, you need a forest. Because all the animals that come in will go through your forest, will propagate the plants, will fertilize the plants. Uh, mostly in Sri Lanka, they eat the plants, so we have to throw firecrackers at them. But it's important, forests are so important. And, and I think what you're doing here and what some of you are about to do is also an excellent thing. Um, we, we in where I live in my little seaside side town, we only eat organic. The chickens run around free and what they do with the chickens is they actually take them in caravans. So the chickens live in caravans and people with large enough properties, once a week, when the chickens roost, they take the caravan around to the next pasture. And so these chickens are just fertilizing. The organic farmers look at all of their animals following each other. So the cows first go through, they chew it up, they dig it deep. Then the sheep follow and the sheep crush the manure into the ground and they eat the next level of uh, grass and then the chickens come in. So without forests, without um, us thinking about the environment and without us dumping garbage into the sea, none of us will be able to eat. So just a little, you know, a little word from a chef, because to me it's so important. And we, we, we're, we're constantly, our, our health is getting worse because we're eating processed food. And the only way that we can improve our health is by actually eating organic, pure, good food. And that only comes when you have a healthy land. So with that in mind, we have, I don't know whether any of you have been, but down there there is an amazing organic garden. There's a forest of houses on the back, but there's many trees. And the kids that, from the college here actually first learn where their food comes from. In Australia, if you show a kid a steak that's wrapped in plastic and you say where that's from, they'll say, oh, that comes from the supermarket. They have no idea about the process. A few days ago, I took all of these kids at 4 o'clock in the morning to Nagumbo, and one of the things I said to them was, you need to make friends with the fishermen. The fishermen probably can't swim but he's out at sea for a month catching the fish. Then he comes to the shore and there's the big, big Mudalali there trying to sell his pile of fish. And from there, the little guy buys it. He gets on his bicycle and he rides around the village to try and sell it. All of these people are so engaged in what they do to bring us amazing food. So we need to respect that. We need to respect them. We need to respect the, the air that we have to breathe. And all of that comes through Christopher's talk about forests. Let's just keep growing trees. We can cut them down, but cut down the ones that grow quickly. Leave the ones that are there for a long time. All right, enough. So in the garden, they have incredible greens. And I've chosen something that hopefully from today onwards you'll have every single morning. Go to color in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, we all know, right? Everybody knows. We don't know how we know, but we know it's good for ailments. We know that this beautiful green herb eaten freshly is fantastic. Um, and, and we try and eat it as often as possible. In Australia, when the, Australia, when the Sri Lankans first started to arrive, they realized, hey, Asanka, they realized, I like that guy. He's, he, if you want to see a guy who's passionate about conservation, that man over there. Um, so. In Australia, when, they, when, when Sri Lankans arrived, they used to smuggle little bits of gotu cholera into the country. In Australia, you cannot bring anything into the country. So the government started giving people gotu cholera. And it's the most beautiful ground cover. It's still hard to get, but it's wonderful. So what I've done is I've made you a gotu cholera elixir. And from this day onwards, you should be having a shot of this every morning. It's tambili, which we can't get in Australia. Tambili with the flesh. Gotukola, which we know it's good for. Ginger, which is also good for us. Blended, that should be your heart starter every single morning. 
Then I thought, well, vegetarianism um, is, is a very healthy thing. I think uh, Sri Lankans pra practice a, a, new, a new style of vegetarianism, which is called flexitarian. So mostly vegetables with a little bit of meat, which is not bad either. With that in mind, and one of my favorite vegetables, Ceylon spinach, it's hard to get again in, in Australia, but here it grows wild. You have to cut it down off your fences. So it's one of those things that's probably polluting your, or you think is getting in the way in your garden. Start using it. I just stir fried it with some leftover rice because we don't like to waste things and got a whole lot of beautiful salon spices, ground them up and served it. And then cassava or manioca. Eating a lot of starch is good if you're a bodybuilder. But if you're, if you're not moving all the time and if you're not exercising all the time, that turns into sugar, which is another big problem here. My father died of a heart attack. He had diabetes. He had heart problems. So I've always been thinking, how do we um, eat all these things that we love without actually dying from it? So what I've done is I've made a, a manioca floss. Now, when you fry things, a little hint, if the oil is hot enough, and the food is cold enough, they react against each other. So what happens is you can fry stuff in good oil. Now, unfortunately here, everybody thinks that margarine is butter, and they also think that uh, palm oil is vegetable oil. And they're two very bad things um, if in quantity. So I've used sunflower oil. It's more expensive, but then think about how long you want to live. Toss it up. Eat bad stuff and die young eat good stuff and live long. So I've fried manioca, finely, finely sliced into a floss. And what you're going to do is have a little bowl of my spinach rice with some uh, manioca floss on top of it. And it t it's tasty because I know that Sri Lankans always go, where's the taste? So I'm giving you flavor, but I'm giving you health and I'm giving you all the mouthfeel that you'd normally have, but about a quarter of the calories and no trans fats. And so with the help of forests, with the help of you know, us thinking about our land, with organic farming, with no fertilizers, you know you can have your whole garden with no fertilizers as long as you have companion plants. So you grow roses, and your roses are the sacrificial plants because the, the insects love the roses more than they love your chilies and more than they love your spinach. I can do, my backyard's tiny, I have three patches. We feed ourselves from it. We have lots of rose bushes, we have lots of other, other vegetables, but the, vo the food that we eat doesn't have anything on it. I can go into my garden and eat anything because there is absolutely nothing on it. So just think about it. I always talk too long, don't I? I'm going to uh, feed you when you come back. It's just a little taste. And then those beautiful ladies out there who are the, the parents of the, the children who come to this school will give you all the bad stuff. So don't worry, you'll get a bit of both. Enjoy. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, just to mention who those ladies he's talking about, in this center, we have a women's development program. They are the parents of the uh, unemployed, uh, less um, privileged youth who benefit from the Empower Culinary School. This is a culinary school, which is the only World Chef certified school in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is very unique because it's a tough program. We have teachers uh, from Australia, from New Zealand. We have people from around the world teaching chocolate, uh, all the stuff that Peter talked about, but it's also free. One qualification, you have to be passionate, well, two qualifications, you have to be passionate and you have to need help. So you have to, uh, you have to be, be uh, uh, enthusiastic and want to do better in life and what they have done has amazed us. So Peter is being supported by uh, several of those young men and women, and in fact, some of them are also cerebral palsy or Down syndrome, showing that there is no barrier if you set your mind to it. So this is a center that is all about what can be done and less about what can't be done, just like the topic we talked of just now. So ladies and gentlemen, um, with that uh, little uh, um, sort of ad to convince you that it's worth coming back up here after we do the signing, I would uh, like to invite the Conservative General um, the participants, our uh, colleagues in this venture, and each of you to come down to the butterfly garden. Um, Shirani, uh, Harshini will lead us down. We will sign, 
make the undertaking and then come up to enjoy some of Peter's cuisine. Thank you very much. Harshini, if you can lead us down. that will symbolize our commitment to um, seeing this uh, restoration with uh, so many other dimensions that uh, were shared with you earlier. It is uh, uh, a venture that involves the state in a true uh, PPP, where there is a partnership involving the 
private sector, multiple private sector actors, which is uh, especially significant. And I'm very honored that today we have DEMO, HNB, Jetwing, NTB, Nations Trust Bank, People's Leasing and Finance, Cyan City Cement, Virtusa, and Dilma Silonti Company present here, partnering with IUCN, the Department of uh, Forests, and uh, also BSL in uh, undertaking this venture. So I would like to of the persons if they would wish to make a short declaration uh, in connection with their organization's commitment to biodiversity and biodiversity as being the heart at the heart of uh, the environmental priorities that uh, uh, we, we talked about a little while ago. So may I first invite Demo, Mr. Suresh Kunaratna. May I also invite the Conservative General to come and take a seat here. Tanuja, may I invite you to come and share the declaration on behalf of BMO? Good evening. Uh, I read out uh, sustainability, what it uh, means to DEMO. DEMO is committed to being a partner in sustainable development. This is reflected in our vision statement uh, by the leadership and in the mission statement. Uh, we at DEMO are fully aware that being a partner in sustainable development is not a choice but an imperative. As with many other business enterprises, our value creation activities bring about economic, societal, and environmental impacts. For us, the challenge is to minimize adverse impacts and Im maximize on positive impacts. Managing the environmental impact, which is a key dimension of sustainability, is put into action on two fronts. Firstly, we commit ourselves to strictly manage the environmental impact resulting from our business activities by integrating best environmental practices into the activities of our value chain. Secondly, we participate in the collective responsibility of the business community by taking part in environmental protection and conservation activities beyond our business boundaries. Partnering with uh, Biodiversity Sri Lanka Life Project will, one, will be one of such initiatives that we take pride in, which will support protecting life on land, life below water, and climate action. In conclusion, let me quote our chairman, Mr. Ranjit Panditake. Quote, we have pledged to act responsibly when carrying out our business activities and to be responsive to the expectations of our stakeholders. We will also participate voluntarily in activities beyond the boundaries of our entity, taking on our share of collective responsibility. End of quote. Thank you.
Thank you, Suresh, and thank you, Demo, for your participation. I would like to invite Mr. Hemanta Senviratna from Hatton National Bank PLC. So the uh, agreement has already been signed by Mr. Jonathan Alas, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. So we will simply uh, uh, okay, exchange contracts. Thank you, Hatton National Bank. Um, Jetwing Hotels, represented by Sashika. Thank you, Jetwing and the Kure family. Now I would like to invite Mr. Teja Silva from Nations Trust Bank. Teja, yes. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, while Teja is making, uh, uh, make, uh, uh, making his uh, signatures, I'll just make a few comments on our bank's uh, focus. Uh, about 10 years ago, we uh, started uh, a public-private partnership with uh, Hiare, uh, at the, uh, uh, conserving uh, that that uh, sanctuary uh, in a public-private partnership. Uh, and our focus has been to educate our younger generation on on the value of biodiversity. And with initiatives like this, we feel that we our, our stakeholders can stay engaged. Uh, and we can give the opportunity for them to have a great understanding of the value of biodiversity. Uh, so we, we make this opportunity uh, something that we can carry on for our bank.
Thank you to Nations Trust Bank and to Mr. Peja Silva. I would like to invite Mr. Lionel Fernando of People's Leasing and Finance PLC. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Lionel Fernando and People's Leasing and Finance. I would like to now invite Ms. Ms. Fazana Khan, Sam City Cement. Yes, please. So at NC Cement, we are committed towards sustainability and we lead the discussion for sustainable construction. Uh, our cement is the first certified green cement, which means we emanate less CO2 in the manufacturing process. And through the line, we look at all our processes to minimize the emissions to the environment. And our partnership with IUCN goes over a decade from the time we were Holcim. We were part of Holcim then and now we see cement. And uh, IUCN has supported us in marking our biodiversity indicators in the quarry area and to do the animal rescue. And last year, for the first time, we published a book, a coffee table book, together with IUCN. And we have hope to continue this sustainability journey in all our endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Farzana. May I invite uh, Mr. Del Denver De Silva from uh, Vertusa. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I wish to thank uh, the Biodiversity Group and Dilhan for giving us the privilege and honor of being a part of this. Um, Vertusa being an IT services company, you wouldn't believe is that much uh, involved in uh, or concerned about uh, the environment and emissions, but we are, we are actually looking at recyclability of code, reducing our cycle time, reducing our emissions by, we've reduced it by 23% in the last three years. Um, and we've completely focused on building a sustainability capabilities across the globe. We operate in 49 locations across seven, uh, 19 countries now, and we've been pushing this agenda. We have renewable energy that uh, supports one of our campuses in Chennai. And in Sri Lanka, because we are in a rented property, there's little that we can do. So thanks to biodiversity, we are looking at this as an investment in the right direction, and we look forward to supporting you even further. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Denver, uh, from Bertusa Private Limited. And now, last but not least, I would like to invite my colleague Asanka from Dilma Conservation, representing Dilma Silanti Company Limited. Asanka, you'd like to say a few words? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of uh, Dilma Silon Tea Company PLC and Dilma Conservation, I would like to uh, pledge, not only pledge, to say something very special. Today we became carbon neutral in all our products, 2,756 products, 4.6.41 uh, million, million kilos of tea became carbon neutral, and every single uh, uh, tea cup that you drink from today onwards will be carbon neutral. Thank you. Every tea cup from Dilma. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Asanka. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, so um, may I invite the Conservative General back because he missed his copy of Peter's signed book and Tilak's beautiful art. You know, Tilak's art generally goes at a million rupees plus after a couple of years. So please, all of you who received that art, you will have a good return on your investment in the future of Sri Lanka in uh, that artwork, so please keep it carefully. Thank you for all the support. Thank you. For all the support that the Conservative General has provided us in bringing a true PPP, a true partnership for biodiversity, we are truly grateful. IUCN, we would like to invite on behalf of the regional director if you can ask Christopher to come forward and receive our gift New Zealand and Australia they have a love-hate relationship so unfortunately I'm giving a Kiwi a book signed <laughs> by an Australian. Aussie but I'm sure you will forgive Peter he is truly actually a Sri Lankan so <laughs> thank you and thank, thank you for your presentation today you. so ladies and gentlemen that concludes the formal part of today. Uh, the next is just for us to have a little fun and to enjoy the biodiversity and sustainably uh, harvested cuisine that Peter has prepared. Everything, all the ingredients come from the DC SARC, that's the Dilma Conservation Sustainable Agriculture Research Center, which is just uh, 100 meters in the other direction. If you would like to have a look around, you're welcome, but otherwise back, the way, uh, back up to where we came from and out on the veranda the uh, students of Empower and Peter await you with some beautiful food. Thank you for joining us today. I'm sorry, may I uh, hold you for one minute? Um, in amongst our small team, we have uh, uh, several very committed people. Harshini, who is GM, but one person who particularly for this project I want to appreciate that is Roshan, who has from the inception, uh, through the various partnerships, development, uh, on to this day, has been very passionate. Ultimately, it's passion and commitment. Uh, when they meet, you have extraordinary results. So thank you very much, Roshan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Join me in appreciating that. And now, please enjoy Peter's hospitality upstairs.
is a whole uh, tambali including the, um, the flesh and then a piece of ginger. A little bit of salt and that's it. And that's what you'll be drinking there. We'll start bringing it around to you. That's not too hard, only takes a few seconds. And then just strain it out. And what's left, put into your garden so that it fertilizes your garden. Now that took about three minutes to do. In Australia, we have to do it ourselves, but you guys have, a lot of you guys have help. But once you teach them, that can be your starter in the morning. It's just a great way to start your day. Um, we'll start handing these out, or if you'd like to come and collect them. Can you guys get a tray going? We'll just get going. The next is the rice. Okay. Like this. Yes, you can start the rice, Reggie. Start. Okay, go. All right, so with the rice, I was just, when you walked into this room, you could smell coconut oil, right? The coconut oil that the ladies are using over there is the coconut oil that you're used to, which is, now there's two ways to do this. Some of you won't like it, it's not to your taste. It's like medicine, just have it quickly, okay? But if you like it, you can sip it. Um, this coconut oil is virgin coconut oil, it's white. Um, the reason it's white is, is the way it's extracted. It's actually pressed without heat. And so you end up with something that doesn't actually go through a heat process. Anything that goes through a heat process, it changes the fatty acids in it. The oil over there smells nice, we're used to it, but it's actually already bad for you before you consume it because it's got all the wrong uh, cholesterols in it. So consider that. That's 800 rupees though. So you know that's one of those things as well. Comes down to uh, cost. But in all of that rice, which will feed all of you, I've got about three tablespoons. Because the spinach and everything else is what's going to give it the beautiful flavor. Coconut oil is good because it can take heat. And I have a few ingredients here. Got it. I have a whole lot of spices, coriander, fennel, um, dal, uh, cumin seeds, and they're all roasted and they're mixed and made into a masala, which you can come and smell later. Um, and then I'm just starting by crackling the, the mustard seeds. The smell, uh, if if you want to later, just the cooking smells between that coconut oil and this coconut oil is totally different. And I think a lot of people um, that I've met who have coconut plantations, during the war time, they didn't have enough money to put fertilizer in them. And that's become a real bonus because now they're all organic. And Sri Lankan organic coconut oil is on all the shelves in, in Australia and the supermarkets. So if you've got a coconut grove, don't put any fertilizer in it. 
you'll get less, but it'll be better. Onion, garlic. These are some of the students from the school. If you go onto the MJF Foundation site, there's a whole lot of photos about our, our journey to the markets at 4 a.m. a few days ago, which was great fun. Yeah, so once the onion, garlic, and chili becomes fragrant, then we add the Ceylon spinach and wilt it. A little bit of paprika and then a little bit of the masala that I've made beforehand. Wait until you cough. My dad used to always say, if you don't cough when you're making a curry, it's not good. And then rice. A little bit of salt. Salt's an interesting thing too. We need to start cooking with less salt and your, your palate will soon get used to it. And again, another very, very quick side dish, quick snack for the kids, and it's all with leftovers and stuff that grows in your garden. I haven't cooked the spinach all the way because the heat will actually wilt it. And then finishing it with some cashew nuts or whatever nut you like. And over here, I've made some cassava floss, which is the manioca. And that's a nice little snack for the day. Now you can all go and eat. Thanks. Thank you. Where's the trays? Where's the trays? One of you hand it. Oh, turn that mic. Here you go. Like cooking in a nun. Come to the plantation again. Just come and stay.